we are living in the most bizarro episode of the Twilight Zone that I can possibly imagine here. It really makes no sense. ADAPT 2030 Mini Ice Age Conversations covers changes in our climate due to a new and intensifying grand solar minimum. In the media, overlooking, downplaying, or burying cold weather changes occurring on our planet. This is in order to keep the global warming agenda steaming full speed ahead. I do this podcast and radio program because we need to begin conversations on how to adapt our food growing strategies long before 2030 as agricultural zones shift, affecting global crop output, but very few mainstream media outlets are talking about the most important issue of our time, cold weather crop losses. Our sun is going through a 400 year cycle, which has effects on our weather patterns as our magnetosphere weakens and the jet streams go out of flow. It's not CO2, it's not you, it's the sun. Are you ready to thrive in the grand solar minimum? Then join me for many Ice Age Conversations. I'm your host, David Dubine. All right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are on the planet. David Dubine, your host, Mini Ice Age Conversations podcast and ADAPT 2030 channel on YouTube for more in-depth analysis on changes our Earth is seeing in the grand solar minimum, how this is going to affect your life, your family, the economy. I wanted to start it with something a little interesting. Iguana-sized cousin of the dinosaurs discovered in Antarctica. Archaeology News Network. And this is one thing that I, I'm really curious about is we've been told that Antarctica has been covered for millions of years with ice. And then suddenly Antarctica was not always a frozen wasteland 250 million years ago. But ice ages are only 100,000 years. And even the grand glaciation cycles of 400,000 years occur. So how many pole shifts have occurred during that time? Let's use the very conservative number, which I think is rather uh, too long, of 700,000 years. How many times could 700,000 go into that 25? The 250 million years, how many times could 700,000 go in there? So how many pole shifts have occurred, and how many grand glaciation cycles have occurred All flip-flop, flip-flop, heat, cold, heat, cold, move, planet, move, North Pole, move, planetary movements. I do not believe that Antarctica was always in the same place it had been. It couldn't be, literally, at the very south of the planet to be covered in ice. Antarctica had to be in a different place. That's all I'm going to say about this article. It's really interesting to read it. Iguana-sized cousin of dinosaurs discovered in Antarctica And they say, well, Antarctica has not always been a frozen wasteland. 250 million years ago, it was covered in forests and rivers, and temperatures rarely dipped below freezing. But where was the location on the planet? That's what they're not discussing. Okay, is Antarctica in the exact same place as it was when these same conditions were happening? I think not. So the types of changes that we've seen through millions of years on this planet are cataclysmic comparatively to what we're seeing today. We got commentary, bombardments, wiping out, ushering us into the uh, younger Dryas era. That was only 12,000 years ago, a little less than. We got Antarctica in the wrong place, an entire continent moved somewhere. How much damage would that have done to any civilization at the time if the actual continent shifted on our planet? Like Charles Hapgood talks about Earth's crustal displacement, something like that. In 200 AD, the pole of the North Pole magnetically It's the exact same spot where it's transiting to over right now. If the pole where we are now continues another 400 miles further south, it will be in the exact same position, literally less than 100 miles away from where it was in 200 AD. And speaking of cycles, life and death rhythms of ancient empires, climatic cycles influence rule of dynasties, A predictable pattern of religion, war, prosperity, and debt. This book available on Amazon. The life and death rhythms of ancient empires outlines the flow of history from 3000 BC into the Wolf Minimum, 1400 AD. Identifying factors causing the rise and fall of dominant cultures 
which then could be roughly forecast in terms of hundreds of years. A review of ancient history provides the basis for a glimpse into the future. This century's global temperature increases, which so excites environmentalists, can be shown to be part of a thousand-year climate cycle. Research has shown that periods of hot and dry climate or cold and dry climate have effects on human behavior. Dominant, prosperous societies have occurred at roughly 200-year intervals, which can suggest timelines for societies into the future, enabling a forecast that the USA might lose world dominance in 2040. If you want to support this broadcast, click the link in the description box to explore more about life and death rhythms of ancient empires and climatic cycles influence rule of dynasties. It's available in both paperback and Kindle versions and lays out succinctly where we're going in the next 20 years in terms of the grand solar minimum. Now at that point, it took a huge clip going northwest and started to come back into the North Pole over, you know, a different part of Russia coming back into the North Pole. And then it jumped and went west or east again. And so it kind of recirculated itself back into what we consider the North Pole. But you have to realize that itself is a cycle. I did a whole video on this one just last week, and I put those charts up comparing the last 400 years of movement of the magnetic North Pole with the last 2000 years of movement with the magnetic pole. And where we're going now, it is a cycle. So I was thinking about what happened in 200 AD, circa the beginning of the collapse of Rome. Vesuvius eruption, 79 AD. These are the types of things that we were seeing, the warring factions fighting for food, etc. Why did the Roman Empire collapse, do you think? It wasn't because they spread themselves too thin. Like That's always the misnomer. Oh, they spread themselves too thin. Not enough resources. Are you kidding me? Not enough resources. 2,000 years ago, how much resources would there have been on the planet comparatively to today? Because we heard the same thing again today, not enough resources. But when you write stories with a straight face and say, oh, well, Rome, they didn't have enough resources, I just almost bend over laughing hysterically like 2,000 years ago, the forest <laughs> would have been larger and the, the lakes would have been more stocked with fish. The oceans would have been more full of sea life. There would have been more game, more, uh, there would have been more of everything. You could have dug straight into veins of deposits of minerals at that time. And there weren't enough resources, really. That's the excuse they're giving you for the collapse. How about the Justinian plague in the grand solar minimum 535 that just crushed whatever was on this planet? with three major volcanic eruptions that put so much sulfur dioxide in the air that people couldn't breathe for four years. The respiratory illnesses swept the entire planet. And that's one thing that you see again and again. I don't care if you're in Japan, China, Europe, South America, Central America. They all talked about the same thing. The air made them sick. And then when you trace back, there were three major volcanic eruptions occurring within those couple of years. A... They had years without a summer where no crops grew. B, bubonic peg was wiping out everything, black death. And C, the air was so dense with sulfur dioxide that, of course, people's immune systems got even more depleted. And then they were using wild cures like drinking mercury and stuff to help rid your body of toxins. And I guess that wasn't much help. Lead pipes probably didn't do much either. But in hindsight, looking back at that chapter in the decline and fall and the ultimate collapse of Rome, it wasn't from resource depletion. There weren't enough resources. Come on. Even when you look at the world in 1940, just after World War II, how bountiful the oceans were, how vast the forests were, comparatively to what we have today, what we haven't stripped, cut, burned, chopped, dug up, that's left out there. 2,000 years ago? My gosh. So there had to be other causations. And when we look at the planetary uh, magnetic field wandering around and you find that same kind of termination point over Russia, west of the Kamchatka Peninsula, 200 AD, and we start to see these massive eruptions ticking off at the same time, it just makes you wonder. See, that's a cycle. And you can't tax the sun. You can't tax a cycle. You can't tax natural activity from the cooling and warming of our oceans in the Atlantic on a 60-year cycle. You can't tax that. 
So they're going to bring it all always back to CO2, something you're culpable for. You bad, polluting human, you change the planet. So I think there's a, a concerted effort to, you know, hide these provability mappings of history that prove cycles are in play, not you, not CO2, it's the sun. And I'll keep coming back to that again and again, it is not you. They're going to say it's you and they're going to demand world taxes. But when they get the world taxes, the money they spend is not going to revert the climate back. It can't. It won't. So then what? They're going to have hundreds of trillions of dollars just laying around in vaults everywhere. And then what? They're going to have no control to do anything except make you poorer. And again, the reason I do the channel, because these two are so interwoven, it's like fabric on your shirt. Crop losses and economy declines, they are intertwined because if you're spending double or triple on your food, you're pulling from the rest of the economy. Now, with that said, I wanted to caveat into some interesting stories that I'm starting to find around the net that are they're pushing back against the global warming narrative. And I think it's a snowball effect at the moment because more and more every day I look, it's another mainstream person and mainstream economists coming out just slamming on this whole IPCC CO2 model driving all the changes. And what's most interesting is the economists are now the very fervent ones pushing the solar activity model saying, look, it's not CO2, it's the sun. We could find this repeatedly through history. And these guys study cycles. That's all they do is study economic cycles. And all it took was that one magic piece to overlap solar activity on all the other you know, economic models they have out there. And these guys are flabbergasted, you know, tongues dropping to the ground, falling on their backs like, oh my God, these two overlaps perfectly. It was the missing link. And once seen, never unseen. And this is the reason that all of these mainstream economists that you're looking at on the net are 100% into, yeah, Big changes are coming. Food prices are going to rise. It's going to affect the economy, and it's the sun. By telling you about magnetic field lines or magnetic pole wandering that goes back to 200 AD with solid science, peer-reviewed research, that's a conspiracy video in their opinion, which makes no sense to me because I'm using re peer-reviewed research, science data, and it's a conspiracy because it doesn't say CO2. And this is where we get in the gray area here. So I'm wondering with all the economists picking it up, how long is it going to be before YouTube starts flagging all the economists out there? Martin Armstrong, Gerald Salente, Peter Schiff, everybody in between. Because they're all talking about solar activity being the cause of, uh-oh, the economic devastation that's at our doorstep right here. So when we look to Russia, you know, Russia was supposed to be the savior to save all, to give us all this extra production this year. Well... They had a smaller crop by 4%, and they are halting some of their exports. As I spoke about last week, they give the excuse in the media like that the citizens had protested so much and the farmers had protested so much because of exports that their food prices were rising in Russia, that they were trying to close down the economy in Russia. So the agriculture ministry backed off on the exports, and everybody in Russia is happy, happy. But for me, that doesn't fly because, you know, when you start protesting in Russia and China and these kind of places, what happens? And America, too. Don't kid yourself. What's happening to France? You think they're allowed to have free protests in France? Yeah. <laughs> Democratic. Yeah, right. Oh, we live in the freest country in the world. We can protest anywhere we want, anytime. Yeah. Until the police shoot you with, with exploding rounds and thing. So anywhere you go on the planet, there's really no freedom of protest anymore. And all freedom of speech is being curtailed because... Things are going to get so nasty, so unfurled, so unbelievable in the future here that they're not going to want you to communicate with each other. And they're going to try to spin these little narratives like, oh, this country is still so perfect. Like they do in North Korea. You know, they have a lockdown on the news. You know, believe it or not, there's like 80 percent of the people in North Korea that believe their country is the best country on the planet. And everybody else outside is living in squalor and envying North Korea on how advanced their technology is how advanced their mathematics and whatever else they have going on, their rocket program. But 80% of the population believes that in North Korea, North Korea is the number one on the country or number one on the planet, economy-wise, science-wise, everything-wise. 
And they brainwashed them into believing it, and they believe it hook, line, and sinker. Now, my whole thing is, when that country opens up pretty soon, like, what's the psychological devastation going to be to realize that you're really at the bottom two or three countries? That every other country's literally a century ahead of. You know, like, how are they going to unbrainwash the people when the true information comes out? See, this is the same thing with the CO2 narrative. Whether it's North Korea, and 80% believe that. The same thing with the populace here on the planet. It's probably closer to 98%, 97% that believe Global warming is true and it's all CO2 based. What happens when they realize and understand that it's not and they've been lied to for all those years? And I wonder what's going to happen in North Korea when it opens up the next couple of years. Like, how are those people going to deal with it? But when Russia comes out and says we're not going to be exporting the amount of grain that was suggested for the surge from last year, that we're going to start cutting our in, our exports you know, you're looking at bread prices and wider inflation. Now, wide in inflation running at 2% globally, that's fine. That's just a, a benchmark that everybody kind of pegs off of, which means they're stealing 2% of your money every year. And everybody just goes along with it. Like inflation, oh, it's just natural. No, it's not. It's called inflated money printing by the Fed and others, ECB. You think the European Central Bank, just, they're stealing your money every year. 2% of the money is being stolen from you yearly. That's what inflation is. You might as well change the lexicon to 2% theft per year. But when the bread prices and all these other inflation indicators are screaming far ahead of 2%, 20%, 18%, there is a serious problem with the food supply. Things that are going up 30% in foodstuffs, that's a red flag. That's way beyond 2% theft regular inflation. And then they put it down. Well, it's stepped up port inspections. Those guys cost more, so we have to spend more for exports because, you know, we got to pay these extra inspectors. How much does an inspector cost to work an extra day over time? Even if you're sending out, let's say you're sending out 60,000 tons of wheat on a break bar vessel. And let's say it takes 10 inspectors to get through it and it takes them two extra days of 10 people. Even if you're paying them 200 bucks a day for 10 people, for two days, you're looking at four grand to try to reinspect the ship. Four thousand U.S. dollars spread over sixty thousand tons should be cents per ton going up, not thirty percent rise. See, this is you need a calculator when you start looking at these news reports now because they make no sense either. We are living in the most bizarro episode of the Twilight Zone that I can you know possibly imagine here. It really makes no sense. So when you see, like, Martin Armstrong comes out, I was reading this article. I like Marty. Marty, if you're listening, I want to team up with you. I got a little, lot of good info about uh, cycles further than what you're talking about. So Martin Armstrong slams Al Gore's deliberate global warming fraud to increase governmental power. And that's kind of the way that the new narrative is going for the counter CO2 individuals and corporations, et cetera, out there. What they're looking at it is, it's just a way to get more government control and reduce your wealth and spending further. So call it out what it is. That's truly what it is. They want to usher in socialism in so many places because the government nanny state needs to take care of you. You can't do it yourself. TrueLeafMarket.com. I really want to talk about growing your own food, which will be a necessity moving forward. There's so many ways that we can go about growing different types of vegetables that we're going to need. You know, microgreens are incredibly nutritious. They're super fast to grow. In less than a week, you can have something that you can eat. Also, sprouts. We can get those a little bit taller, a little more dense, a little bit larger volume on the vegetation mass coming off of there. So how do you know what kind of sprouts to grow? How about wheatgrass or herbs? What about different types of herbs that we can add to our foods? Now, what I just described to you, there's a full range of starter guides there at trueleafmarket.com for you to take a look at. Even if it's just for your own knowledge and you don't purchase something from them, at least get the information so you know how to grow microgreens, you know how to grow sprouts, you understand what some of the herbs are for. Trueleafmarket.com. Use the link below and give yourself the gift of organic and heirloom seeds. He earned, you know, how many hundreds of millions of dollars did Al Gore earn spouting the global warming narrative? I'm not a sellout. Even if you offer me $100 million to do something like that against me, we're, we're, we're at the point where money won't matter really anymore anyway. So to sell out at this point, eh, buying your ticket to doom, I guess. Hundreds of millions of dollars Al Gore has made. Now, you have to remember, 
in the 1970s, they were talking about deep global cooling, 3,600 year cooling cycles, etc. But it seemed that the sun had one last spurt. Now, the modern car engines don't have the same effect. Let's say, you know, let's say you're driving something, uh, say 1970s Jeep, for example, compared to a new computer controlled uh, fuel injection system. When you run out of fuel at the very end, when you're just at the last sputter before the tank literally runs out, and literally you are on the last before it goes, boom, where your engine stops because there's literally 0% more fuel. In the older engines, you get that one last big spurt of energy. I think what it is is really the fuel is gone, and what it's doing is recompressing the gas that's left in there that's still fuel-laden. And you get that massive boost, and then nothing. But in the new computer-controlled modern fuel injection, you won't get that same effect. This is kind of what our sun has done. In the 1970s, 1980s, coming into that solar cycle, they thought solar cycle 22, 23, we were coming down. They thought 21, we were coming down into a new ice age, literally miles of ice above something's head, or at least a progression into there on at least a huge steep drop into like 3,000 year cooling, 2,000 year cooling. But then the sun had that last giant spurt, shipack. And you might ask how much extra energy was released from the sun in the 1990s. Well, it was the most solar activity, the highest solar activity in the last 3,000 years. That's how much additional solar activity there was in the 1990s. And that's why I come back to that El Nino and the amount of exceptional heat across his planet during that time was from the height, the most activity in our sun recorded in 3,000 years. So again, if you come in and say record heat causes record cold and record snowfall, we should have seen that in 1998, 1999 with the El Nino, but we didn't. That's a flag right there. Check. You got to ask people questions about that. But since that time, that 3,000 year massive blast in solar activity has dropped literally on a vertical cliff going down. Now we're heading into something where we're going into a multi century decline in solar activity, literally. 400 years, we haven't seen this. So Martin Armstrong's calling all this out right now saying, hey, you talked about it in the 70s that we were coming into an ultra cool period. This was staved off with two exceptionally high solar cycles with the one at the apex of 98. And now it looks like we're going to return right back to what you scientists were talking about in the 1970s. We're going to drop off a cliff into cooling again. We got the reprieve for a solar cycle and a half because of the sun's last burst. And if, if you look at it in the electric universe model, we talk about current inflows into our star as a cosmic capacitor. If it was overcharged, it would have released that. And that's exactly what's happening. So look for more massive releases of energy coming out like X28 flares like we saw before. X30. That wasn't like an X31 flare. So lucky it didn't direct toward our planet. But this was a discharge of overcharge. As we progress further, our sun's going to discharge more because it needs to equalize with the lower current inflow. You have to think about it in terms of electricity and magnetism, and they're, they're combined, but electromagnetism, but I want to, just as in a simple way, I want to you know separate those two into just electricity, like a current inflow. Think about a socket in your house. You know, you ever get a, a low current inflow when there's a huge draw on the grid sometimes and your, your lights start to go zzz, and they get visibly lower because the current flowing in is not enough to keep it highly charged. That's the exact same thing that's happening with our sun in a plasma flow, in a Birkeland current. So that inflow of electricity coming in and magnetism ties it all together. That's what holds our solar system in place. And this is how the you know, universe revolves in its mathematical formula. The base construct is electromagnetism. It is the soup of plasma that holds everything together. But when the current inflow to the star decreases, you'll see like in your house, sometime that current inflow and a visibly noticeable dimming in your lights. Well, this is going to happen now, but it's going to last for, I don't know, 20 years. And instead of being a flickering two or three second event that's visible in your visible you know, wavelength with your eyes in your house where you see your lights dim for three seconds... We're going to see the sun dim for 20 years. 
And this is what's going to cause the problems with our crop losses. And now everybody's on to it. Now, what next question is, economists and researchers are on to it. How long does it take before the rest of the populace on the planet's on to it? That's when it really changes the society as we know it. Because everybody will be like, uh-oh, we all got to get ready right now. So back to Martin's article here. He's talking about in the Newsweek magazine, 1975. And there's a whole bunch of plethora of magazines at that time. National Geographic, Newsweek, Nature. They all came out with the exact same thing. Climatologists are pessimistic about Arctic rivers ceasing and all these types of things. They're talking about Arctic rivers ceasing. They actually had the plans to try to melt the polar ice caps, to try to stop the freezing event that's happening up there, to plunge us back into this ultra 400 or 3600 year event. They actually talked about trying to melt the ice caps to stave off this global ending civilization reset freeze event that's on tap. And when they were talking about that in the 70s to try to melt the ice cap to save our planet, they even talked about the same things. Like, you guys need to stockpile food for multi-generations. Well, Valentina Zarkova comes out and says the same thing. You need to stockpile. You governments need to get ready right now because we're going to have very little food growing from 2028 to 2032. You guys need to start stockpiling food for a generation why is what is this copy paste thing from the 70s happening right now again? Now, the 1977 Time magazine article goes on to claim an enormous amount of names saying that the Earth's temperature, average temperature is going to drop anywhere from two to 20 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on where the cooling is occurring. Now, that's a big step, in my opinion. 20 degrees down is a full blown ice age. I mean, full blown two miles of ice over New York ice age kind. Two to three degrees, four degrees Fahrenheit down is a grand solar minimum that wipes out traditional crop production globally. Literally, it does. We have no more crops grown except for equatorial bands. So if you look at the positioning of governments across the planet, who's putting the chess pieces in which place? Notice where the chess pieces are being put in warm equatorial belts or areas that could be brought, on, brought online as food grow zones. This is what you need to look for. Forget the energy. That's a that's fake now. That's that's all just a, a smoke and mirrors ruse. The real most valuable commodity moving forward is going to be food. So look where the food positioning is going, because that is truly what it's all about. Because he who has food controls the society, period. Control the money. Yeah, you can control the economy, control the food. You can control the people. That was I think that was Kissinger that said that. That brings us right back into the thing again. Like whoever controls the food supply is the new ruler of the planet. No ifs, ands, or buts. So then, you know, we saw this whole thing in 98 with the uh, ultra high solar activity. And then Gore comes out at that same time. You know, he, he was dabbling his fingers in it. And what I find so interesting is after the presidential election, when he lost to Bush, he was suddenly just so believed because he was robbed of the election but he already put the framework out there and kind of the basement foundation for his dabbling into the, the climate debate at that time. So it wasn't as if he just hopped out of nowhere saying, hey, climate. No, he'd already been you know, laying down foundation for four to six years, actually four to five years prior to that in the 90s, talking about uh, can we tax, can we use tax revenues to try to uh, – you know, help and switch from agendas and global warming, et cetera. It was very vague at the time how Al Gore spoke because it was science wasn't settled then. Of course it wasn't because right in the 70s, they're like, dude, we're going into like a full on <laughs> incredible cold. And then we come out to this full on incredible heat and just 20 years of difference that the science still not settled today either. And it never will be because it's science. You understand that the sun is the, the center of our solar system. It used to be believed forever that the Earth was the center of the universe. People had to question that. Look at those planets and watch the Kepler and be like, wait a second, that did not go the direction it should if we're the center of everything. So you got to realize that science has never settled. So everything you've ever believed up to this point has been proven some sort of incorrect or just false outright wrong. Even when we talk about coming into smaller realms of our own universe here. We have molecules and atoms, and then talk about that base construct layer of plasma and electromagnetism that holds it all together. 
you know, we talk about quantum universe that wasn't even really talked about highly and proven or really scientifically, you know, able to prove until the 1980s and 90s. And for sure, in the last couple of years, last decade, we've been able to hone it down. So whatever you knew in the 50s is the working model of the universe construct was proven very limited only into our states of matter, which vibrate with either atoms or molecules holding it together at these larger chunks of matter holding together. That was it. So there's another whole layer beyond that that was just proven to be true, which was theorized. What if they would have stopped back then and said, ah, the science is settled. There's nothing deeper. Don't even look. Nanoparticulates, you know, same thing. Buckyballs and all these things that we're now trying to use for water purification. Oh, you can never string all these carbon atoms together to make nets or anything. Ah, you're kidding me. Graphene, Psh, what's to you guys? No, science is settled. You can never do that. This video is brought to you by our friends at trueleafmarket.com. Heirloom and organic seeds for any grow zone on our planet. 